Welcome to the fourth meeting of the 22nd season of the Harvard Law School Forum. Tonight, our topic is abortion. Our panelists are the Honorable Albert Blumenthal, the Reverend Robert F. Drinan of the Society of Jesus, and Dr. Alan Guttmacher. Dr. Alan Stone is our moderator. On Friday, February 23rd, Senator Howard Baker of Tennessee and Senator William Spong of Virginia will discuss the two-party South. And on Saturday, March 9th, Malcolm Mugridge visits the forum. On Friday, March 15th, Bishop Pike comes to Cambridge. In keeping with the theme of this program, I'd like to present a monologue. If you are wondering why this program is on a Monday, it is because the forum has declared it a Friday. <laughs> Welcome to our Christmas program, where we pay tribute to one unmarried pregnant woman who is able to get along without aborting the child. While we try for balance in our programs, we admit that tonight's panel actually has only one side represented, those who live. This is just another example of how people who don't know the law and have no lobby lose out. For those of you who are interested, North Carolina has the shortest residency requirement, and air service from all major cities is excellent. You must stay there four months, which of course means that you should go before the conception. Paul VI recently suggested colonization to the Indian ambassador, but when this didn't work for Japan, they promoted abortion and in the 1950s showed the fastest drop in the birth rate ever experienced by a civilized nation. The legal implications of such a move by the United States are numerically astounding. Justice Douglas, in throwing out the Connecticut birth control law, pointed to the First, Third, Fourth, Fifth, Ninth, and Fourteenth Amendment as involved. The privacy surrounding the marriage relationship, according to Justice Goldberg, has best been stated in the Ninth Amendment to the Constitution, which reads, the enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage other rights retained by the people. The model penal code would allow abortion where two doctors certify either risk to the physical or mental health of the mother or risk of a physically or mentally deformed baby or rape or incest. This topic will be of more concern to the law school next year if Lewis Hershey's suggestion is followed and we have an all-female student body. We are especially proud of our panel. Fresh from his work on the New York State Constitution, Mr. Blumenthal comes here to tackle the topic of abortion. Besides co-sponsoring... <laughs> Besides co-sponsoring a bill to permit therapeutic abortions in New York State, he has proposed a housing rehabilitation plan. We understand that builders under that plan would not be allowed to build apartments with more than two bedrooms. Dr. Guttmacher pointed out to me the contradiction in the title, for as we know, with abortion there is no issue. <laughs> Father Drinan pointed out that this problem will eventually be solving itself when there are only Catholics left. <laughs> we apologize for Father Drinan being in uniform. <laughs> we had planned for all our panelists to be in plain business suits and for the audience to guess who was who. But Father Drinan indicated that in these times there was a real chance people might think he was leaving for good. Dr. Alan A. Stone, MD, graduated from the, me from the Yale Medical School. He is a professor at Harvard Medical School and at Harvard Law School. At the law school, he teaches two courses with Professor Dershowitz. He teaches psychoanalytic theory and legal assumptions and the prediction and prevention of antisocial conduct. He has written two books, Longitudinal Studies of Child Personality, and the abnormal personality through literature. He is a native of Boston, but nevertheless a psychoanalyst. He is currently preparing a report on 
psychiatric aspects of abortion. May I present a man who welcomes this opportunity for group analysis, Dr. Stone. Mr. Sawyer's intention is to leave the panel speechless, but this panel will not be denied. <laughs> I've already had several uh, suggestions. One, what is a psychoanalyst doing in this spot anyway? Uh, two, let's skip all the emotional issues and get to the metaphysics. <laughs> I won't tell which one of the panel made that suggestion. <clears throat> uh, but I'm going to try and give you some, uh, to live up to my profession, some free associations. They're not really free associations. They're rehearsed free associations. What do people think of <clears throat> when they think of abortion? Or at least what do I think of? Infanticide? Feticide, murder, playing God, meddling with creation. Is it a life? I think of criminal abortion, women dying, getting infection, sterility. Who's going to defend the embryo? What about the sanctity of life? What kind of doctor does criminal abortion? How do they do it? It must be awful. Why should she have to have a baby? Her life is ruined anyway. <clears throat> the shame of it all. If they can get away with that, the next thing will be euthanasia. What will it do to sexual morality? Why do they need it when they have the pill already? She'll hate herself forever. She'll hate the baby. Well, in a hundred years, there won't be room to sit down anyway. So I guess we had to come to something like this. But who will decide? You know, when you think about it honestly, it could have happened to me. Now, a brief reprise from the rational side. Looking at some of the statistics, that's always rational. <clears throat> Abortion has been practiced in virtually every society known to man. Let's look at the birth rate in the United States. It's approximately 4 million a year. Now we have estimates for the criminal abortion rate. They range from Andre Hulliger's, a professor at Johns Hopkins Medical School, who says something under 100,000 a year. They go up to Alice Rossi, a professor at Johns Hopkins Department of Sociology, who says there are more than a million a year. Those are what are known as soft statistics. But the impact of even the lowest estimate, one criminal abortion for every 40 live births is shocking. At the recent conference in Washington, sponsored by Harvard's Divinity School, a figure of 200,000 criminal abortions a year, or one for every 20 live births, was widely accepted. <clears throat> Now, this is to be contrasted with 10,000 so-called legal abortions. I say so-called for several reasons. First, the advance of medicine in the past 20 years has made the purely physical reasons for abortion to save the life of the mother almost negligible. Therefore, as Judge Bazelon describes the psychiatric profession, the janitors of, of society, the largest percent of legal abortions are made on psychiatric recommendations. We take care of the mess. Yet as a psychiatrist, I suggest to you that there is almost no scientific psychiatric basis in the majority of cases to justify the assumption that abortion is better for the mental health of the patient than no abortion. It will come as no surprise to you that most legal abortions are obtained by wealthy women. The right of, the, of abortion then has not been protected with the same rigor as the right to counsel. You may, on the other hand, be surprised to find 
that the majority of women who seek abortion are not unmarried. Rather, they are married women with children who don't want another one. In fact, a study of a group of women who died of criminal abortion in New York revealed an average age of 25 and an average number of children they already had of 3.2. Now, a final word about abortion laws to try and help set the scene as I see it. The abortion laws of the United States, most of which came into being years ago in the 19th century, many, were principally directed against the abortionist and not the mother. Now, medical science has made abortion less dangerous than tonsillectomy, <clears throat> less dangerous even than childbirth. In contrast, criminal abortion in unskilled hands has a significant risk, both of sterility and of death. The laws, even if liberalized, as in the ALI provisions, would do little, if anything, I believe, to lessen the amount of criminal abortion. I'm told, for example, that in Colorado, where ALI was made law, it is just as difficult to get an abortion as it was before. Perhaps Dr. Guttmacher will have much more information on this and something to say. Now, I believe that this is in part because the medical establishment is basically conservative and the medical criteria are not easy and not convincing. Even drastic liberalization that nonetheless deprives the woman of privacy, that stigmatizes her, that leads to delay, may not lessen criminal abortion if we can accept the Swedish experience as a fair example. There are problems on the other side. In Hungary, where abortion and contraception were widely and quite liberally introduced, the population began to drop drastically, they felt. Now you can see, and I hope that you don't see my particular position, but I hope you can see that the issues are not simple. There aren't any simple arguments about abortion. There's no simple pro and con, and we are therefore most fortunate to have three such distinguished guests tonight. Our first speaker, the Honorable Albert Blumenthal, is a New York Assemblyman because of his willingness to espouse and pursue vital questions of social policy. He's gained a following outside his home state. He is a veteran of the legislative abortion war, where he at the very least has earned his Purple Heart and the right to command your interest tonight. Legislation re regulating abortion is now being studied in many states, most dramatic in the state of Maryland, where recently a bill was proposed to remove abortion entirely from the criminal code. It narrowly failed. With this kind of legislative ferment in the air, we turn with anticipation to Mr. Blumenthal. Thank you, Dr. Stone, Father Dryden, Dr. Guttmacher. My partner, who uh, was a predecessor in interest here at Harvard Law School, saw the speech that somebody had suggested I might give tonight and told me a short story, I guess reminiscing to when he went to school here, of the minister in his community who had just assumed the pulpit and was making his or giving his first sermon on a Sunday when his wife passed the usher a note and asked the usher to please bring it up to her husband before he started the sermon. And the usher took the note and snuck up the side idle and tried to get to the minister before he started and he missed, he couldn't quite make it. And he snuck a uh, look at the note and on it was printed in very careful lettering, K-I-S-S. -S. And the usher thought, well, now isn't that wonderful? What a lovely couple. We have a fine minister and his wife for our community. And he waited until the minister had finished his speech and it went a little long, but he finally was through and the usher came up with the note, handed it to the minister and the minister looked at it and he turned around to the usher and said, why didn't you give me this before I started? And the usher looked at him and he said, but, but Reverend, you did very well. 
He said, I know that, but I didn't listen to my wife's advice. And the usher said, what do you mean? He said, well, don't you see what it says? It says K-I-S-S. -S. That means keep it short, stupid. <laughs> I wish that the debate on abortion had been shorter. I must admit that when I joined the legislature five years ago, which is not unlike joining the army, Nobody ever told me that my reputation as a boy legislator would be made as the champion of abortion reform. It's uh, even led to some thought that I might be a feminist and no end of problems with my wife who knows better. The, the problem of abortion reform, I think, was pointed up by Dr. Stone. Maybe it was part of his free flow but he used the expression, it could happen to me, meaning him. Well, I know it can't happen to me, and I think he knows it can't happen to men, him. And I think part of the problem with this whole debate, very frankly, has been that a lot of men are doing the talking, and not enough women are. I think we face problems in life where we ought to be able to recognize ourselves where we are most competent to speak. That doesn't mean we should always remain silent. It just means that we ought to be gracious enough and intelligent enough to recognize our limitations. And I haven't heard about the man who's need, needed an abortion yet. And I'm somewhat confused by the fact that this panel, as is true of almost every panel on which I've participated, is made up almost completely, almost is made up completely of men. <laughs> My, uh, my new counsel wrote a long speech for me. I got a new counsel. I think the leadership in the New York legislature is trying to buy me off. And it's very long, and I'm not going to read it because I'm not very good at reading speeches. I get too nervous. I miss a word, and then everything gets all mixed up. Dr. Stone gave you the figures, and I don't think it's important for the purposes of our discussion, although Father Drining will disagree with me. Whether we agree that 200,000 or 1,000,000.200,000 is the accurate figure on the number of abortions which are performed in this country each year. I think there are two other figures that are far more relevant and far more important. The first is that the figure sometimes used is that there are eight to 10,000 legal abortions performed in this country each year. That is an erroneous figure. What that figure really is, is the number of abortions which are performed in hospitals. And that is not necessarily the equivalent of being legal. Dr. Lewis Cooper, who heads the Department of Pediatrics at NYU, testified at our hearings last year that following the German measles epidemic in 1964, he personally is aware from the records of 1,000 abortions performed in New York City for German measles, for the gross deformity which the physicians felt would follow in any baby born of a mother contracting German measles within a stated period during her pregnancy. And under New York law, which now is also the law of 42 states in this country, all of such abortions were and are illegal because the law of New York is very plain and very simple. And it says that an abortion may only be performed where the physician reasonably believes that it is necessary to preserve the life of the pregnant woman or of the child. How that or phrase got in there, I'm really not quite sure because I'm not aware of an abortion that preserves the life of the child. But one thing I am certain, but I'm not a doctor. Of one thing that I am certain, and that is that there was no rubella or German measles abortion performed. It was performed to save the life of the pregnant woman. It was performed for a very plain and simple reason. And the reason was best described by a New Jersey court, which that was last March, which threw out or sustained the throwing out of a lawsuit by a young couple against their physician for his refusal to perform an abortion under New Jersey law, which is similar to New York, and described the then seven-year-old little boy. 
is totally deaf, totally dumb, totally blind, and permanently mentally retarded. The pregnant woman, the mother, the mother-to-be, had contracted German measles during the first 30 days of her pregnancy. And this was the result. I'm not a physician, and I will leave the argument as to what is the accuracy of abortion as a cure, if it be a cure, for the threats to the health of the pregnant woman, which either a grossly deformed fetus can present, or pregnancy resulting from rape or incest can present, or a physical impairment can present, or mental illness can present. I can't, in good conscience, enter that argument other than to say that the experts who have and who testified at our hearings made it reasonably clear that under some circumstances, all of these presented medical problems for some pregnant women. I don't think that's my function as a legislator, other than to make a finding that there's a problem, that it's a medical problem, that there's a solution that's required. What then is the course of action that we can take? Because I think Dr. Stone was correct from all that I know. And that is that the majority of abortions which occur today occur in women who truly don't want a child, however good the reasons, but primarily because they have more than they feel they can care for, or because occasionally it occurs in a woman who is not yet married and who would find motherhood an embarrassing or an uneconomic or an unhelpful circumstance. The bill which I am sponsoring together with this year 44 other legislators in New York will not deal with that woman's problem. We will deal only with the medical problem and the rape incest problem. And our best estimates, and they're purely guesstimates, are that we're talking about 15 to 20, maybe 25%, but I'm inclined to believe 20% of the number of abortions performed in this country, both in and out of hospitals. And on what premise do we proceed? Well, this is at least in part a law school audience. I'm going to abuse the non-law students for a moment, and I hope you'll forgive me. But I think it's essential that I do this because I think in opposing at least this limited change in the abortion law, we are misunderstanding something that is very fundamental and very basic in our law in this country and in our social attitudes. Father Drynan will argue in a few minutes, most persuasively, he even persuades me sometimes, that we are dealing with human life when we deal with a fetus. That birth, after all, is merely no more of a birthday in the course of human development than the 21st birthday, which entitles us to vote. And that we can no more take life prenatally than we can postnatally. And he may be right, I don't know. But I do know, I do know, that certainly the right to take life prenatally should be no less than postnatally, at least where it concerns the right which all of us have, whether we be men or women, and most particularly when we be men, because we assert it as part of our masculinity, particularly the right to defend ourselves against those who would threaten us. For a while, Father Drynan's argument really bothered me. It bothered me when he and Professor Byrne of Fordham Law School would cite the case of the interuterine transfusion performed to save the life of a fetus over the religious objections of the pregnant woman, where she is, I believe, a Jehovah's Witness, said that it was improper to violate her body for medical purposes but as a religious tenant of hers. And I had a lot of trouble with that case. And I finally came to the conclusion that were I the sitting judge, I would rule exactly the same way. I would order the interuterine transfusion. And I decided that the reason that I would do this is that religious liberty and religious freedom is an inherent right which we all must enjoy and must be protected, but not at the cost, not at the cost, of the life of another. And to me, that's a 
clear rule, and it's a respect that I can give to prenatal life without coming into an argument with the problem which abortion presents on medical grounds. And the reason that I say that is best illustrated by the example that Professor Herman Schwartz up at Buffalo Law School gave in an article that he wrote last year. When he talks about the problem of the woman who was raped, and don't misunderstand me, I am not posing the question of rape as the reason for changing the law. If there are 100 pregnancies arising from rape in the state of New York each year, it's a lot. And while my heart goes out to the women who find themselves in that situation, that is not the reason for the change. But the illustration is important. Normally, I don't know anybody in the audience to whom I can speak when I pose this problem, but this time I do. And so I will pick on my hostess for part of the evening, a very nice, pretty blonde young lady sitting up in the front row, and ask her, ask her with you, to place herself on the subway platform in the city of New York, where she is approached in the most polite of terms by the would-be rapist who says to her in plain language, now, madam, I offer you a clear choice. And I want you to understand that it's a clear choice. I want you to understand that if you submit quietly, no arguments, no discussion, that there will be no other hurt to you. But on the other hand, if you refuse to submit quietly, and if you argue with me, there will be a great deal of hurt to you. Under New York law, and I would be reasonably sure it would be true under Massachusetts law, I'll consult the dean of Boston College in a moment, law school. Uh, my hostess would have a choice to make at that point. She could submit quietly with no further argument or discussion. Or if it were within her power to do so, she could kill her potential assailant. And was she to kill him, it would be justifiable under New York law, and I would assume it would be justifiable under Massachusetts law. So she would have a right to protect her body from harm, but strangely enough, assuming that she decided to submit, and assuming she became impregnated, that means pregnant, <laughs> and assuming she was so unhappy by the circumstance that even Dr. Stone, with his dispassionate discourse on the problem of abortion, might be willing to say that it was traumatic, injurious, maybe bad for her even. <laughs> No right of defense under New York law. No way to protect herself. And of course, Father Dryden will say, but the fetus is innocent. And that argument gave me a problem. Until I reread, and it shows you, you know, I think I'm a pretty good legislator. And I try to read everything. When I tell you that we passed the revised penal law in New York with less than a half hour of debate, and it was twice as long as the, its predecessor, you'll understand that I couldn't read everything. But there is a discussion in the revised penal law, which I want to close on. And it's the only part of my poor counsel, poor Roger. It's the only part of his effort that I want to deal with and I, I, I do it because I think it's important that we place this whole question in context. And what I'm saying to you will become very clear when I read these words. One's view of abortion need not depend on one's view of prenatal life. And so say the practice commentaries which go with the revised penal law when they explain when physical force may be used in self-defense. And I'd like to read some of these quotes to you. Such conduct is necessary as an emergency measure to avoid an imminent public or private injury which is about to, be, which is about to occur. 
by reason of a situation occasioned or developed through no fault of the actor. This is the measure of justification of defense if Mr. Sawyer came at me with a knife. Let's go on. What are some of the other things that this language would justify? Well, of course, New York is not only New York City, it's upstate. So you have to understand that the practice commentaries refer to all parts of the state. We're very democratic about how we enact our laws. It would justify, for example, breaking into an unoccupied rural house for the purpose of making a telephone call vital to a person's life. Well, all right, I mean, breaking down the door, that's not such a problem. But what else will it do? Assaulting a person who has a virulent contagious disease in order to prevent him from going out and starting an epidemic. Well, for goodness sakes, Mr. Sawyer, you have German measles, danger of. One step up. When you're born, I can assault you. <laughs> Not before. But let's go a little further. What else can I do under New York law? Well, I can use deadly force, but provided only that I reasonably believe that another person is using or about to use deadly force against me, well, that's the existing abortion law, abort to save life, or using or about to use physical force against an occupant of a dwelling while committing or attempting to commit a burglary of such dwelling. Well, isn't that great? This poor lady's pregnant as a result of rape and we can't save her life, but come in and steal my watch and I can kill you. Or committing or about to commit a kidnapping or robbery. Isn't that great? Property rights are very important in New York. What are some of the other things that we can do here? Interestingly enough, and it's the final exam, example I'll give, we can kill a trespasser about to burn down a bond. Some people have criticized the bill which we have presented, and it's very explicit. I think even Father Drynan will concede that it's far more explicit than the American Law Institute recommendations. He might even approve, as America Magazine does, of changing his view where it is sufficiently explicit. But I'd like to ask the law students here, if we're going to consider prenatal worth, to answer two questions. Does the pregnant woman have the same right to protect her health as society has to protect itself against virulent disease? The second question is, does that same pregnant woman, woman have that same right as the farmer does to keep his barn from being burned down? In the old country, and it makes no difference what old country you come from, there's a story about how they took care of old age problems. They didn't have Medicaid or Medicare then, and so they had a simple solution. They led the old people out to the woods, and the animals and the elements solved the problem. And there came a time in the old country, it makes no difference which old country. I understand they did it in all the old countries. Even the Indians did it. The time came when a particular old man was going to be led to the woods for his day to meet his maker. And his nephew led him across the field. The old man began to cry and the young man looked at him and he said, God, grandfather, he called him grandfather. Please don't cry, you're making this very difficult for me. And the old man looked at him, and he said, my son, I cry not for myself, but for the day that this will happen to you. I think that we have reached that stage of development. I think that medicine has reached that stage of development where we have determined that it is not enough to breathe that there is a quality of life to which even women are entitled. And there is a quality of life 
which justifies all of us in saying, you don't like abortion, don't have one. But where physician and patient say that's the appropriate medical remedy, then the law should be compassionate and understanding enough to permit that remedy to be exercised. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Abortion and contraception have become popular social issues to be discussed <clears throat> only in the last few years. Our next speaker, however, has lent his scientific skills, his name, and his energies to these problems for many years, when to do so was to be labeled a crank or worse. Through it all, Dr. Alan Guttmacher was and is one of the leading figures of American medicine. He holds many uh, important positions and titles. Tonight, he speaks for himself and is well qualified to do so. Dr. Alan Goodmark. I apologize for not being a woman, but uh, it's too late to change at this juncture. As a physician, I'd like to survey, in a rather general way, the current abortion situation, and then suggest what remedial measures might be applicable. Present abortion statutes make hypocrites of the medical profession. It is estimated that at least 70% of the illegal abortions are done by physicians. Some full-time operators, others part-time workers who want to pocket quick cash. Abortion fees must, almost, must always be paid in greenbacks. Professional abortionists uh, I have known, and I've known good many, vary in character and outlook, but all have two things in common. First, their services are never free and each thinks himself a knight in white armor, astride a white steed, intent on rescuing ladies in distress. If they didn't, they couldn't live with themselves. The facts that there are no free illegal abortions, no clinic type of setup, makes for the rankest discrimination. Abortion patients get what they pay for. A high-priced abortion is usually safely performed by a professional medical abortionist or a qualified part-time physician, frequently an obstetrician. A low fee is likely to employ some paramedical person, perhaps a hospital orderly or some nurse, and are usually a very doubtful safety. The lowest investment either results in self induction by means of a bougie, a slippery elm stick, a hat pin, or perhaps the cooperative effort of a kindly neighbor who aids in the use of the same weapons. Even the 10,000 legal or therapeutic abortions that Mr. Blumenthal referred to, which are done in the hospitals of our country, are discriminatory. Therapeutic abortion rate among hospitals in New York City shows that there are 2.5 per thousand live births on the private service of the hospitals and 0.5 on the clinic service of these same hospitals. The pooled statistics of 11 large hospitals on the eastern seaboard showed a legal abortion rate among white patients of 2.9 per thousand live births and among non-whites of 0 0.08. I think 
all of us will agree that all is not well regarding abortion USA. There are three possible solutions. First, law enforcement can be stepped up and illegal abortion, the third largest US racket after gambling and narcotics, can get its wings clipped. In regard to illegal abortion, state boards of medical examiners can see that each physician lives up to the exact letter of his state law. In 47 states, abortion can still only be performed to save a woman's life. A second possibility is to repeal all abortion laws permitting abortion on demand, the only control imposed by the woman's conscience. Third, existing restrictive laws could be modified and liberalized as they have been during 1967 in Colorado, North Carolina, and California. Now, how about these three propositions? What's wrong with rigid enforcement of existing statutes? First, it's impossible. People at all levels oppose our abortion laws. In a democracy, when the majority oppose a law, the law becomes unenforceable. According to the National Opinion Research Center, 71% of Americans favor legal abortion if a woman's health is endangered by pregnancy. 56% in rape cases, and 55% if there's strong likelihood that the baby may be born with a serious defect. Among Catholics, 58% favor legal abortion if there is danger to life, and 46% approve it for rape. Of over 40,000 US physicians who answered the survey by Modern Medicine last spring, 87% favor liberalizing the abortion laws. Second, in addition then to it not being enforceable, as a physician, I strongly oppose literal interpretation and rigid enforcement of existing abortion statutes. Through the loophole of individual interpretation by hospitals and physicians, a small proportion of the patients who in my eyes merit legal abortion somehow obtain it. But if we were to tighten the screws of the law, even they would be deprived of such beneficent help. Third, there would be general opposition to the harassment or elimination of the illegal abortionist, particularly if he's safe. A good abortionist is viewed as a social necessity, as the bootlegger during prohibition who did not dispense hooch with wood alcohol. In brazen hypocrisy, our culture has declared most abortions illegal, but at the same time we try to protect those who resort to abortion as well as our illegal perpetrators. There are astoundingly few prosecutions compared to the vast number of illegal abortions performed. According to the law, the patient herself is guilty of a felony, as are those associated with the crime, such as referring physicians. However, as far as I know, neither is ever prosecuted. In the infrequent instance that abortionists are brought to trial, Non-medical abortions may get moderate sentences, but the courts are lenient with MDs, usually putting the offender on probation or giving him a light sentence. Perhaps they are lenient because the doctor is additionally penalized by his colleagues who sit on boards of medical examiners, some members of which no doubt have referred him patients. These boards uh, either permanently or temporarily revoke his license. The second possible solution is total repeal of all abortion laws. Let us see what's right and what's wrong in permitting the woman full choice in determining whether or not she will remain pregnant. The woman has to bear and rear the child. Therefore, who is more capable of choosing between birth and abortion? Childbirth is a personal experience and as such neither involves church nor state. As Mary Manis points out, abortion laws are the work of the inseminators, not the bearers. 
Abortion on demand would greatly speed the goal of making each child a wanted child, which would reduce the vast army of neglected and rejected children and have our third the 300,000 illegitimate children born in this country each year. Then, too, it would take the powder out of shotgun marriages, which contribute so heavily to the inordinately high divorce rate among teenage brides. Then, too, abortion on demand would eliminate the racket of illegal abortion and therefore, uh, in large part, get rid of this very flagrant breach of the law, which certainly shows and sows disrespect for the law. It would reduce abortion on demand, uh, social, economic, and ethnic discrimination. Now, it would further reduce the U.S. birth rate. We now have a birth rate of 18, and if we had abortion on demand, one could not tell you exactly how it would lower the birth rate, how much more, but it would certainly bring it down to perhaps uh, two or three points. This, some of us would think, might be a significant advantage in a population that's already growing too fast. Now, what are the arguments against abortion on demand? Some claim that abortion is murder, and therefore abortion should never be performed, or if done, only in those very rare cases in which continuation of pregnancy may cost a woman her life. Those who claim abortion is murder believe it immoral and decadent to sanction legal termination of early pregnancy because a woman simply elects not to bear a child. The lines have been drawn between the two camps, the theists and the humanists, one defending every fetus's inviolable right to be born, the other holding that those already born must be granted precedence and allowed to protect themselves against an unwanted pregnancy. The fact that 71% of Americans, including 87% of physicians, favor extension of the practice of legal abortion attests that the humanists are winning over the deists. But the fact that only three states have broadened their abortion laws shows that the deists are giving ground slowly and begrudgingly. I believe strongly that abortion is not murder. Destruction of an early conceptus differs in no essential from destruction of the sperm cell or egg cell before the act of fertilization. No one mourns for a sperm killed by a spermatoxic contraceptive cream or an ovum permitted to die 12 hours after ovulation because the woman from whose ovary it came knew how to prevent its survival by practicing rhythm. Sperm and egg are living cells before fertilization. Otherwise, conception could not occur. In the continuum of living matter, they remain living cells with and after fertilization. I cannot allow myself the impious thought that the Godhead rides each spermatozoan like a horseman and enters the egg cell bestowing upon it the sanctification of the Godhead. To me, an early conception is not a human being created in God's image is a potential human being created in man's image. It is a mass of undifferentiated cells which sort themselves into a specific pattern according to the blueprint architected by the DNA given them through the inheritance from each parent. The difference between an early embryo and a living person is immense. The embryo has no consciousness, no life experience, no previous association with fellow humans. Therefore, equating the elimination of a mass of developing cells with infanticide, euthanasia, and genocide is offensive and patently fallacious. The charge that liberalization of abortion laws will inevitably lead to these practices is illogically and wickedly inflammatory. Has liberalization of the divorce laws led to abolition of marriage? For me, the end point when abortion is no longer permissible is not governed by intangibles like the exact day or week when the fetus is assumed to receive its soul or when the mind is thought first to function, but by medical considerations. A 26-week fetus rarely lives after natural birth, but if it does, 
a fetus so small, fragile, and immature, has grave likelihood of serious brain damage. And therefore, to forestall this possibility, I feel a full four-week leeway should be given in producing an aborted fetus. Therefore, I approve of abortion only up to the 22nd week, but not beyond. Like all arguments charged with such deep emotional content, especially arguments of a philosophical moral nature incapable of proof by experiment, it's nigh impossible to convert minds already committed. Thoughtful men of goodwill who believe that abortion is murder certainly will not be persuaded by my arguments. I fully respect their opinion, but quickly confess that arguments by theists fail to change my mind. A second argument against abortion on demand is that it is likely to change basic human values. Perhaps it does, but I've seen no evidence of it. Visits to Japan and Yugoslavia have revealed no essential differences between human, value, between human values and moral judgments there and in America. There seems to be the same sense of family unity but the same worshipful parental attachment to young children. Birth, marriage, and death appear to have the same dramatic importance. A third objection to unlimited abortion is the report of frequent undesirable psychic and physical reactions following its legal performance. I bring this matter up to lay a ghost. There is no evidence of this. There have been three important articles in the medical literature published in 1966 which have analyzed this, and there certainly is no evidence that there is any untold, untoward psychic trauma following abortion when it is done under proper auspices. Now, despite the fact that I do not believe abortion is murder, that unlimited frequency of illegal abortion virtually eliminates the abortion racket, that I feel the woman should be the judge as to whether an early pregnancy should continue or be terminated, that easy abortion neither creates moral or sexual decadence, nor is commonly associated with or followed by undesirable physical or psychic effects, I oppose abortion on demand, at least now for the United States. There are several reasons. First, the public does not want it. According to the poll of the National Opinion Research Center, only 20% of Americans favor abortion for single women, and only 17% for mothers who do not want more children, the main seekers of abortion. In a democracy, it is safer to evolve radical social change by evolution rather than by revolution. If we succeed in greatly liberalizing all 50 statutes by 1975, then perhaps in the last decade of the century, state after state will be prepared to totally remove abortion from all legal controls. To be sure, by 1990, this may no longer be necessary. For if before 1990, a safe, effective pill is discovered which a woman can take on the 25th day of each menstrual cycle and will bring on the period three days thereafter, then, of course, the whole matter becomes academic. Second, I oppose abortion on demand because it reduces the necessity to use effective contraception. And as a physician, I feel it is safer physically and psychically to prevent pregnancy than to terminate it through abortion. Third, abortion on demand relieves the male of all responsibility in the sphere of pregnancy control. He becomes a coital animal without necessity to think of consequence, not far removed from the status of a bull. To be sure, the birth control pills almost relegated him to the same brute status. <laughs> but at least he still has responsibility to ask his wife, dear, did you take your pill today? <laughs> Since I oppose current restrictive abortion laws as well as their total repeal, I obviously favor liberalization of, exist of existing statutes. The movement toward liberalization received great interest, of course, by the American Law Institute bill. You know the code. I did not refresh your memories about it. Now, my feeling is that 
the code of the ALI is uh, too narrow. It has uh, too much of a medical focus. It doesn't have a sufficiently broad social focus. I call to your attention the fact that Great Britain, after months of debate in a triumph for humanity and common sense, passed and signed into law on October 27, 1967, a far more liberal law than any enacted by our U.S. states thus far. It will become operational in six months. Abortion will be legal in Britain if two doctors agree that continuance of pregnancy would involve risk to the life of the pregnant woman or injury to her physical or mental health or to any existing children of her family. In making such a determination, I quote, the pregnant woman's actual or reasonably foreseeable environment, end of quote, may be taken into account. This bill also includes a section permitting abortion if there is substantial risk that if the child were born, it would suffer from physical or mental abnormalities. The distinctive feature of the British bill is the inclusion as grounds for abortion risk to the physical or mental health of any existing children, including the effect that an additional child would have on the environment of children already born. This uh, allows consideration of overcrowding, inadequate housing, strain on the mother, and similar factors. In my opinion, we should adopt what the ALI stands for, that is, maternal life or health, pregnancy through sex crime, congenital abnormalities of fetus. But in addition, I would add seven points. One. I would favor abortion of all unmarried females of less than 18 years of age, because I cannot think that pregnancy for them is a constructive experience, and I cannot think that they will make satisfactory parents. Two, I would abort students whose courses of study leading to a degree would be interrupted by continuation of an unwanted pregnancy, because I think that to have a young woman terminate her academic career simply to have an unwanted child is a tragedy. Three, I would abort mothers already caring for three or more children, because it seems to me by the time a mother has had three children, she's a better judge than the courts or the physician as to whether she can properly take care of more children or wants more children. I would abort women of 40 or more when they become pregnant if they desire abortion. I would abort women who desire abortion who are drug addicts or severe alcoholics, women who obviously cannot give children a proper maternal environment. I'm not creating children to have them farmed out and boarded out. I'm creating children to give them a good home. And I would abort women with subnormal mentality, incapable of providing satisfactory parental care. And I would abort emotionally disturbed parents unable to cope with another child. These recommendations may seem unnecessarily specific, especially in view of the vague verbiage of the modern English law. But having practiced obstetrics and gynecology for over three decades, I realize that US physicians seek exact guidelines for whom they may or may not legally abort. Otherwise, their timidity and that of a hospital in which they practice will incubate splendid inaction. Thank you. Well, you can see there are eloquent physicians as well as elegant lawyers and eloquent lawyers. There are now, <laughs> there are now seven bases loaded for the next batter. Seldom 
does a man wear so many hats with such skill and wit <clears throat> as our next speaker? Priest, educator, lawyer, dean, he has made people on both sides of the Charles River and elsewhere in the country take a look at what they were doing and what he is doing. It's a pleasure for me to introduce the Dean of Boston College Law School, Father Robert F. Drynan. Thank you very much, Dr. Stone. Dr. Hugh Makara, Senator Blumenthal, and ladies and gentlemen. I think we'll really have to wait to find out if this fetus is a soul, is a living being, until Bishop Pike comes, and if he can have a seance with it, certainly that proves the case. When your chairman mentioned that those who have no lobby lose out, a little cute story came to mind. I was a visiting professor at the University of Texas Law School last year, and as is my wont, I got involved in all types of lost causes. And there are no uh, statutes protecting illegitimate children whatsoever in Texas. They have no rights against their father or mother or anything. So with the do-good as I went down to see a particular senator in Texas, and he listened to our case, how we wanted a legitimacy law, the Uniform Fraternity Act, and so on. And then he sat back and puffed his cigar, and he said, uh, ladies and gentlemen, all I can say is that Everybody in Texas who gets something done has a lobby. And if you want to do something, then you have to organize those bastards. <laughs> Whenever I uh, am trying to follow two eloquent speakers like this, I am reminded of a story that in the International, <laughs> in the International Peace Corps that uh, three girls were being interviewed one from England, one from the United States, and one from France, and they were given this hypothetical. You are alone on a desert island, and you see a thousand Marines coming who will also be shipwrecked with you, and you are the only woman on this island. What would you do? And the American girl said, I would swim to shore. That's the only honorable thing to do. And the English girl said, I would demand to see the commanding officer. <laughs> and the, uh, the French girl said, I understand the facts. I understand what you say, but what is the problem? <laughs> Well, I'm not here as a Catholic or as a priest, but just a grown-up fetus who was an unwanted child. Uh, and uh, I have the, uh, the perfect solution that if the doctors would work a little bit harder, sorry about that, doctor, uh, and uh, they would uh, have an injection or a pill or something that a woman would uh, take, and on the day of 24 or 48 hours when she is ovulating and uh, can get pregnant, she'd turn a color, like red. Stop! That would solve the whole thing. You know, isn't that funny? No? Well, uh, <laughs> I want to discuss this matter with you and the options that are in the law, and to say to you that uh, this is not only a complicated matter, but it is a matter on which, uh, as a Catholic, and as a uh, person who understands something of the deep moral and religious convictions of Catholics, Protestants, Jewish people, and secular humanists in this country, I say to you that we can't solve the problem simply by basic, ex by principles of expediency or pragmatism. There is a fundamental moral issue here. Let me, if I may, therefore, review with you just briefly what Catholics and particularly Protestant theologians and Protestant groups say, and then move into the three options that the law has available to it and, and ask uh, what are those real gut issues that we should talk about. For better or for worse, the morality of the Catholics, up to this point at least, is relatively clear. And in the Vatican Council they said categorically that abortion is an unspeakable crime. I think that it is uh, more clear among Protestants than you might imagine. And if I may, let me quote the National Council of Churches. I want to suggest to you that this is by no means, as has been suggested in several states where this is in litigation or under legislation, that this is by no means a Catholic versus a non-Catholic issue. In 1961, the National Council of Churches, which represents virtually all Protestant bodies, said this, Protestant Christians are agreed in condemning abortions or any method which destroys human life except when the life or health of the mother is at stake. The destruction of life already begun cannot be condoned as a method of family limitations. 
Similarly, the Episcopalian said this, in the strongest terms, Christians reject the practice of induced abortion. Likewise, the Lutherans and other church groups have said categorically that abortion is immoral except in the extreme case where the life of the mother, or in some cases the health of the mother, is endangered. Protestant theologians say this too. Listen to Karl Barth, that venerable 83-year-old Swiss theologian. He said this, the unborn child is from the very first a child. It is still developing and has no independent life, but it is a man and not a mere part of the mother's body. He who destroys germinating life kills a man and thus ventures the monstrous thing of decreeing concerning the life and death of a fellow man whose life is given to him by God and therefore, like our own, belongs to God. Similarly, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the heroic Christian who was executed by the Nazis, said this, destruction of the embryo in the mother's womb is a violation of the right to live which God has bestowed upon this nascent life. To raise the question whether we are here concerned already with a human being is merely to confuse the issue. The simple fact is that God certainly intended to create a human being and that this nascent human life has been deliberately deprived of its life and that is nothing but murder. I am not saying that all theologians, all church bodies are agreed, but I think, and I could quote Jewish theologians and Jewish bodies and secular humanists who say that our devotion to the sanctity of life cannot be separated from fetal life because it is only, it is not qualitatively different from life after birth. However, does that give us really any clue as to what the law should do in this area? The most sophisticated thing that I have seen was by a group of Catholic Canadian bishops who said this, that from the viewpoint of those who say that this is immoral and that individuals should not morally be permitted to do this in their conscience and by their law, that the civil law should take, from our point of view, the Catholic bishops in Canada said, that we would like to see a law which would minimize the number of fetal deaths. Which type of law will minimize the number of fetal deaths? Before I go into the three options, just let me mention some of the areas of agreement. We all agree, first, that abortion is the last remedy, and that, as Dr. Gutmacher said, it is possible and suggestible only for the non-viable fetus, up to 20 or 24 weeks. We would all agree that publicly supported family counseling clinics are very desirable, and that we would not want, in any case, to have abortion become the birth control of the poor, which frankly I think is a distinct possibility. Secondly, it seems to me that all theologians, including Catholic theologians, would say that in cases of rape or incest, the prevention of pregnancy is a moral thing, in fact a desirable in certain circumstances, and that the prevention of pregnancy is allowable under state law, as I read state law in some cases, in some states, not all. Catholic theology would allow in the life of the mother when the ectopic pregnancy has occurred, a pregnancy in the tube. Also, when there is a cancer in the uterus, Catholic theology following the principle of the double effect would say that the death of the fetus is not intended but allowed and that the life of the mother may be preferred. We would all say, forth, say, say fourthly that there is a right to be born and that that fetus's right to be born must be carried out unless there is a countervailing right in the, those who are living. And that is suggested by the law in many ways. What is the role of law in this matter? Until recently, like so many other things, it was thought to be settled. The law that we have came to us from the Parliament of 1803, from which all, incidentally, Roman Catholics were excluded. The fetus has two rights under our law, the right to inherit and the right to compensation for prenatal injuries, if it is born. Although in the latter, compensation for prenatal injuries, the fetus may recover now, at least in one case that I know of, if it, even if it is not born. This doesn't prove very much, really, but the law does, in fact, confer some rights on the fetus. How shall we uh, uh, treat the uh, present situation? Is the, good, is the present system a tolerable compromise, or should we have the model penal code or third, should we have what I don't call necessarily abortion on request, I call it the withdrawal of all criminal sanctions. Let me go through each of these. What about the present system? Despite what the eloquent people here have said, 
We have a monumental ignorance about the workings of the present system. It seems to me that we don't have real hard information saying that it has no deterrent value. We have many hypocrisies and stated ideals in the law that don't work. And yet, a lot of people, wise people say, that it is better to keep a stated moral ideal even though it can't be enforced. Prostitution is outlawed, and yet it's almost unenforceable. Similarly, gambling is still illegal and criminal, and yet there's a bookie on every corner, at least in Boston, so I'm told. Uh, similarly, sta <laughs> similarly, statutory rape is a very severe crime, and in my judgment, uh, much too severe, and yet both of these individuals can be consenting, and yet somehow through chivalry or uh, something or other, we say that that's a crime that should be kept. Well, there's a total disparity between the stated ideal and the order of reality. Maybe that in and of itself is a reason for changing. On the other hand, if you want to deter something and say that we don't want to have widespread uh, abortion, uh, like widespread prostitution or gambling, then, then you, you have a law there, and we don't know about the deterrent value. I think that at least the law as it exists now protects life. And we say that at every stage, from the moment of conception until uh, Aunt Minnie is, is ready to die, we protect life. It's not always enforceable. We recognize that. It's a very, very hard, clandestine, surreptitious thing to get at. Now, you can keep the present law, but if you're going to change the present law, it seems to me that the model penal code has very severe limitations. And I would prefer, if I would have to choose, I would prefer the withdrawal of criminal sanctions rather than the model penal code. Why? Let me just touch on the three features or the uh, li so-called liberalizing uh, characteristics. The physical or mental health of the mother would be a reason. Let me spell this out in an example. Suppose that the doctors could predict to a woman that if you have an abortion, you will live to be 72, but if you have this child, you will die at 62. We put that in as a stated value in the law. She may prefer 10 years of her life to the very existence of her child. So there's no question now of the death of the mother. That is a justifying cause for abortion in every state. Should the physical or mental health of the mother be a reason? Do you want that utilitarian, pragmatic cause to be put into the law? That, that she, selfishly, she the powerful one who has a voice, can snuff out the life of someone that is powerless or voiceless. That is what it is suggested. The second is the rape, incest, and felonious intercourse. I have very little difficulty with the rape or incest, but felonious intercourse means that a girl under 17 or 18 or 16, whatever the law says, statutory rape, that in those cases, in that case, that is, there is an automatic right. I have great difficulty and my greatest difficulty with the eugenic provision, namely that if there is a substantial risk that the child would be born physically or mentally deformed, then this child may be aborted. This says, in effect, does it not, that we have too many ugly Americans, and we would agree with that, but that this fetus has to be just as bright and beautiful as we are if it is to be born. I suggest to you that that is not consistent with the rest of the model penal code in this area, and that that, I find, is the most objectionable because it would teach and the law in America teaches as nowhere else. We should recognize that even though the law is unenforceable to some extent, nonetheless it states a moral ideal, and as in no other country, the law here is central. Other countries have a symbol of their culture or their unity. France has de Gaulle, God help them. England has the, the royalty. And other countries have an ethnic or cultural or religious or spiritual ideal, which is absent in the law, absent in America, and that's why the law is so important. I could go on and suggest other difficulties that I have, and that as uh, both previous speakers have suggested, the model penal code will not solve the real problem, which is the fact that 80% of all of the women who want abortion are married and simply don't want the child. There's no physical or mental health reason, there's no rape or incest, and there is no predictably deformed child. What should we do because this is the problem? I come to the third option, and I suggest to you that this at least has the merit of not involving the law and society in the business of selecting those persons whose lives may be legally terminated. A system of allowing abortion on request has the undeniable value of neutralizing the law so that while the law does not forbid abortion, 
It does not, on the other hand, sanction it. It does not say we don't want retarded children or deformed fetuses or we prefer the physical or mental health of the mother. The law withdraws and says that we are incapable of regulating this area and this must lie in the consciences of people and in the ethic, ethical practices of doctors. I can find justification for this approach to jurisprudence in many things. I think that, let me quote Father John Cody Murray in his volume, We Hold These Truths. He writes there, the aspirations of law are minimal. Law seeks to establish and maintain only that minimal actualized morality that is necessary for the healthy functioning of the social order. Law enforces only what is minimally acceptable and in this sense socially necessary. Therefore the law, mindful of its nature, is required to be tolerant of many evils that morality condemns. And that approach to jurisprudence would be mine, and I think it would clearly condemn laws totally unenforceable, which exist in some half of the states against adultery and fornication. As far as I know, uh, those things are still morally condemned by uh, some churches, at least my church, but uh, I think that uh, there is no justification for a law which would forbid adultery and fornication because I know of no one who has gone to prison recently uh, within living memory for that type of a crime. Can you spread this and say that this is the best approach to the whole question of uh, regulating abortion? At least you could say that the adoption of such a non-law doesn't escalate or increase the number of legally unauthorized abortions. The adoption of the model penal code will teach, and it will teach that abortion under some circumstances is permitted, and apparently people will get the idea that it's allowable, and therefore, as in Scandinavia, the number of illegal abortions will escalate. If we therefore say that the, the American Law Institute will lead almost inevitably to a de facto authorization of abortion on request, then let's be honest about the thing and say that the law is bankrupt in this area, the law can't regulate, and that we ought to treat women who want an abortion as civilized human beings and do what we can for them. Now, I'm not exactly advocating this because of the monumental ignorance. And if we had more facts uh, about this whole problem, which is so clandestine to repeat, then I would say that this seems to me a much more promising solution than the model penal code. I suggest to you that this law, which is silent about the abortion of non-viable fetuses, says nothing invidious. It doesn't discriminate between those who are born and those who are unborn. And it doesn't say that just because we can't see them, they're not living. It just says this is a social problem for which the law has no regulation in its criminal sanctions. And I suggest to you that this has enormous potential. Why should we take a woman, 80% of them married, and turn her into a criminal because her system of family planning has failed? Under the system of no criminal sanctions, at least we could smoke out the illegal abortionist and that any non-doctor doing an abortion could be put in jail just like we'd put, in, put uh, a non-doctor doing brain surgery in jail. This would be a very severe crime. At least we could smoke out the illegal operations. A woman would have to go to a doctor and there or with others she would get counseling and at least she wouldn't have to hopefully go through this agonizing trauma of another abortion. Doesn't this offer a better possible solution than the model penal code? I suggest to you that it does. However, I'm not saying that that's going to be the panacea. It has at least the one benefit, the long-range good effect, is that it keeps the state out of the business of decreeing who is to be born and who can be uh, abolished. And it, in all candor, keeps more hypocrisies out of the law. We have too many hypocrisies. And if I may men mention one, perhaps a bit indelicate, but some states allow the sale of contraceptives for the prevention of disease, and that's a lie. Uh, that, that's not true. It can't prevent disease. And I suggest to you that before we put more lies into the law, we should say, what is the problem, and get down to the problem and solve it. And it's a social problem. It's not a medical problem. 
I feel badly in handing this social problem over to the doctors. They don't like to do abortions except when medical reasons are indicated. And let's face it, it's a very serious social problem. At least 200,000 women each year, perhaps a million each year. And I suggest to you that if we're going to solve it, then we should say we must get facts, we must hammer out solutions. But nonetheless, there is a moral norm involved. And let me come now to my fourth and final point. What should the churches and those who believe that a fetus is, is just as much a human being as, as an infant? What is the extent of the uh, limits of the persuasion, if you will, that they must uh, uh, utilize? I think that the churches should not be silent on this issue. They shouldn't say that just as the liberals cheered, it, cheered the Catholic bishops in the South when they denounced segregation and integrated uh, segre segregated uh, schools, I, I think that uh, the people should speak out and that we should welcome their speaking out, even though we might disagree with them. How far should they go? To what is the extent of the uh, moral persuasion of the churches? I predict that there will be stormy intercredal tensions ahead, and particularly those Catholics are going to make a lot of noises. And I'm not faulting them for that because the Catholics have been accused of silence long enough and rightly enough. And at this moment in history, when Catholics feel, God help us, a sense of security in America, they are beginning to say that we have a, an obligation towards the legal institutions of this country. I was very proud that 15 Catholic bishops signed a statement, an amicus curiae brief, in the miscegenation case. And when the National Conference of Catholic Interracial Councils filed a very good a brief in that case. And it seems to me that we can't have it both ways. We can't say that it's good for them to speak out when we agree, but not when uh, the tide seems to be going the other way. How firm and uh, strong should they be? There is more Protestant uh, feeling on this, as I mentioned, but that is on the morality of the thing. But whose moral norm should we follow? Clearly, the Catholic Church has the right and the duty, I suppose, to speak out for its own communicants. What should it say to the legislators of America? I would say that after stating the moral norms, no Catholic body, official or otherwise, should take any position on the jurisprudence of this thing. And the right approach, as I see it, is the Canadian Catholic bishops' approach that this is a very complex jurisprudential, social, and moral problem, and that the legislators have to decide what uh, system is best. On the other hand, the Catholics and everyone else should say that uh, there is a right and a duty to speak out, and that even though it's going to be very difficult, the uh, Catholics, shall we say, must at a moment in time use Catholic persuasion, not as Catholic power, but as the honest, sincere opinion of people who operate from premises and presuppositions and who feel that the present law was a law put in by individuals who in their consciences felt that society should protect all law and that simply because a fetus is unseen and its appearance is going to be very inconvenient, we should not operate on the pragmatic and utilitarian thesis that we can wipe out all fetuses whose existence will be inconvenient to us. That is a fair presentation of the law as it has existed up to now. If we do legalize abortion, the Catholic position, those who believe that abortion is wrong, just as infanticide would be wrong, and everyone admits that that is unthinkable, that uh, their principles will remain the same. But nonetheless, everyone has a right and a duty to shape the moral contours of society, especially in a matter so fundamental and so basic as this. I say to you that the essence of the whole moral problem as I see it is this, that the integrity, the untouchableness, the inviolability of every human life by any other human being has been the centerpiece and the, the, the cornerstone of the legal institutions of the English-speaking world. If we want to withdraw that protection now from the non-viable fetus, that uh, small potential human being, call it what you will, then we should know what we're doing and that we're doing it for our own benefit. We're not doing it for the benefit of the fetus. We can say it'll be unwanted and that it'll be unloved, but nonetheless, we owe that it'll be retarded 
but nonetheless we are dictating the conditions of existence for that individual. And it seems to me this inescapable moral issue in this emerging struggle over the wisdom and fairness of abortion laws deserves to be discussed and dissected and eventually resolved. But I suggest to you that if America operates on principles of sentiment and emotion, and certainly there was a lot of that running here, even in this group this evening, if we operate on sentiment, utilitarianism, and expediency, then we damage ourselves. We should try to reach the basic fundamental ethical issue involved, and that, as I see it, is the immorality of allowing the destruction of any innocent human being carried out by other human beings who are more powerful, who can do this for their own benefit, convenience, and utility. Thank you very much. The panel is now willing to entertain questions from the audience. Uh, those of you who would like to ask questions, would you please come to the microphone here, give your name, and ask your question. My name is Greg Harrison, first year law student here at Harvard. My question is first addressed to Reverend Drynan, and perhaps Dr. Gutmacher would like to comment, comment on it. I didn't gather from all you had to say, Reverend Ryan, and exactly what your position would be on contraception, and you'll see how this is related to my question. Are you totally against contraception aside from the rhythm method? As no one is totally against contraception. Well, I'm asking you particularly, are you against other forms of Well, how does this tie into the question here? The question ties in, assuming medical science comes up with a morning after birth bill, or for that matter, a two week after birth bill, is this then contraception or abortion? In that would depend upon the medicine involved and that if this is the destruction of a zygote of a sperm and an ovum that have been fertilized and which by scientific methods is a potential human being with the genetic package with the blueprint and the machinery to produce a human being it, it seems to me that that would be abortion rather than birth control in other words then you would be against the use of a morning after pill so to speak under the name of contraception well this is morality now the legality clearly there talking about stri strictly talking about morality now your own yes. ethical position yeah. you would okay now that leads directly, that fine, that leads directly into my uh, second point. And that I is, was given uh, as moderator uh, 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 the following instructions, questions, not speeches. Nobody told me about interrogation. <laughs> I, don't, I don't mean to be giving the Reverend the third degree. I just, I wanted to lead into this because I thought it was very pertinent. The second question is this. The law tries to steer clear of telling people what they can and what they cannot believe, religious beliefs. We don't because one group has a belief that it is sinful to drink or because it is sinful, you know, quote unquote, sinful to do certain things. The law then doesn't take it upon itself to legislate against doing this. If that's the person's religious belief, then they can refrain from doing it on their own because this is what they believe. Perhaps they believe they'll be punished thereafter. My point is this, if you think it is immoral for, some, for a fetus to be aborted because you believe this is a life, I contend that is this not your own belief, and therefore why should the law have anything to do with this whatsoever? That's what I said in my third point, sir. But You're arguing my case for the withdrawal of criminal sanctions. I'm, I'm all for that, but you then ended your, no, you ended your speech on the note that, this, that you were opposed to the morality, you were opposed on a moral Am basis. I supposed to acquiesce in, in something that I think is immoral? Am I supposed to advance this cause? No, certainly I'm, not. I'm weighing the three options as a jurist, and no, nobody here can predict which option will really bring about the, the better common good. And, and no one can. We just don't have enough information, that's all. And I say that we have to weigh these three. The present compromise, the model penal code, I clearly am against, particularly the, the eugenic one. And I said that the withdrawal has the, the greatest possibility and the potential. Thank you. Uh, my name is Bob Blazer, first year law student. Uh, Father Dryan, if, <laughs> if the church and if society sincerely believes that a fetus is a living being, then why doesn't the church or society conduct funeral services in the case of a miscarriage? The, the Catholic Church does not have any funeral service until the child is at least seven, eight, until the child, you know, 
The, the assumption is that no one is culpable for his immorality or sin until that time, and that there is no funeral service for anyone under seven or eight. So, any other questions? <laughs> question for Dr. Guttmacher. My name is Joyce Massell. Dr. Guttmacher, I am a student at a women's college, and I was born while well, my mother was attending college also, and <laughs> I'm glad I'm here. Uh, I kind of wonder whether or not you said I believe that you would give abortions to girls who are in college so that they could continue their studies. Now, in college today, we are informed of methods of contraception and along these areas. And I think that, you know, responsibility, which is what they're trying to teach us in college, I think, <coughs> should be, um, well, not limited just to academic responsibility, but personal responsibility, what you're going to do. And I think that if a girl decides that she is going to, you know, assume these responsibilities, that uh, I, I want to see why you justify giving her an abortion or why you feel a college girl who is fully aware of contraception as it exists today should be, have a legal abortion. First of all, contraception not always effective. It can fail. And uh, I think that is certainly one good reason. Um, a second reason seems to me is that if uh, the woman uses bad judgment on occasion, I don't see any particular reason to punish her for it. Seems to me that one has to look at the overall what is the greatest good. And to me, the greatest good is allowing this young woman to complete her education. Now, if she can take an, a year out of education and not penalize her future, then I think uh, that's a perfectly logical thing to do. If she's capable of doing it, I think from her point of view, it would be a far better solution. But I certainly have been faced very often by young girls who's... ...of uh, the very... ...action to the child be very different under these two conditions. I'm so anxious that we lay emphasis on what I think is uh, the quality rather than quantity that seems to me that I'm trying to give every child and every parent the best possible break toward happiness with each other. And this to me is a very important goal. And if a young woman has to interrupt or call off her education because of this, it seems to me we're not accomplishing the goal of, of uh, the greatest uh, possible uh, adjustment between mother and child. That's all. I, perhaps I didn't make myself clear. Uh, uh, Dr. Guttenmacher, I think that you're looking at it so objectively. You know, when a, when trying a woman to look at it objectively, yes. I don't think you're looking at it the way a, a woman does. When a woman, I think, becomes pregnant, you, you still feel that she's going to feel this great hostility through nine months, and when the baby's born, she's going to hate it because she has to take a year off to co from college. And uh, I just want to, you know, give the feminine viewpoint, you know, you're not girls, <laughs> that... Uh, I think you're well, I'm sure you're speaking for a large proportion of women, but I'm certainly you're not speaking for all women. Well, I'm, uh, yeah, true. Okay. I think we've kind of exhausted this topic. Oh, yeah. Let's go on to something else. <laughs> we have the next question. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Gerald Lang. I'm a second year law student here at Harvard. And my question is for Mr. Blumenthal. Uh, Mr. Blumenthal, to say the least, I was unconvinced by the analogy you drew between the revised penal statutes and the abortion of the innocent fetus. Now, every example illustrating the point you gave to us, I think, uh, involved a situation where there really was, in a sense, a kind of fault on the part of the person against whom one could use deadly force. Uh, I, I suggest to you that the real analogous situation is a situation where your life is in danger. It's threatened by exigent circumstances, and the question then arises whether you could, in order to save your life, kill someone else who was completely innocent in every single way. Now, as a matter of legal precedent, two cases I just cite to you and then explain very briefly are the Holmes case and the SS Eliza case. Now, these are two shipwreck cases. 
And they happen to be very famous, and they are there. And these cases, Mr. Blumenthal said, where sailors and uh, other members of lifeboats threw other people overboard deliberately, tried to make reasoned choices, those men were guilty of murder. And the rationale of the decision was that there were two courses of conduct open, of course, that is, one could take the chance that one would lose one's own life, or you could deliberately take the life of another person. But to borrow a phrase here from Father Drenan, uh, I think the court believed that civilization's dedication to the divine sanctity of life took precedence there and one had to incur the risk to one's own life rather than taking the life of the completely innocent party. So uh, again, uh, now I think we return here rather than to an argument of legal precedent to the reasoning of your decision and how do you answer that argument there? Do you still believe that one has the right to take the uh, life of a completely innocent fetus? Now you remind me a little bit of Father Drynan who uh likes very much to place things in the absolute alternative. Um, I remember as a child when um, my sister got involved in a terrible argument with a little girlfriend of hers over a doll. And both children were convinced that the doll was belonged to each of them. I'll never forget it. My grandfather is what we, uh, we call a Talmudic scholar. And uh, he had a capacity for arriving at justice that I found unequaled as a child. And when he found that he couldn't resolve the argument between the girls, he took a knife and he sliced the doll right down the middle and gave each one half. Now, Father Drynan poses the problem by saying that he's morally opposed to abortion, I think probably on any grounds, although he makes a few exceptions sometimes. And then he says, but on the other hand, he thinks the solution for the problem is for the law to withdraw because that won't require a moral judgment by the law. And of course, he realizes, I'm sure, when he makes both of those statements in good faith that he poses two completely unavailable alternatives. The legislature is not going to repeal the entire law and the legislature is not going to oppose an enforceable ban. So now let's go to your case, again, posing entirely unrealistic alternatives, not applicable here. You're a second year law student? Yes. <laughs> Have you had your penal law course yet? Yes. And you're familiar with culpability and mental disease and so forth. And you are familiar that a mentally ill person, for whatever your law is in Massachusetts, is not at all culpable, not even knowing, are you not? Well, they, they function under the McNaughton rules here, yes. Well, whatever the rule is, assuming they qualify, they are in all respects non-culpable. And if I had to use an extreme example in order to fit within the tight, tight framework you're going to give me to function in, I suppose I could rely on that one. But I don't think that's really what we're talking about. And the issue is not two men in a boat. And the two men in the boat case is one of those tough cases that make for bad law. And I'm sure there are many abortion cases that make for bad law. What we're trying to do, and I think that ought to be very clear to you, is to take an inflexible, bad law and try to resolve a very difficult problem. The part of the approach that Father Drynan takes that makes great sense is that the law can't do some things. It can't do it. I don't know of a suicide who's been prosecuted. Now, I have a very stern set of personal standards, which I violate sometimes. But my set of per personal standards is clearly not applicable to you, because we don't even agree on the law here. But the law is an inappropriate place to apply these standards. Don't use the two men in a boat case and second year torts. And by the way, I'd like to use another illustration while I got you. You know, it depends on how you say things. Father Drynan puts it, and I think I... I wrote it down when he talks about the law of the states. The fetus has a right to inherit, and then he hurries on and says, if it's born, very softly. When I quote that rule, I quote it a little differently. I say the fetus has no right to inherit at all, unless and until it is born. I go back to what I started to say. The law is many things depending on the circumstances, and two men in a boat is no more applicable to the woman in the backroom abortionist's office 
uh, than a lot of other rules of law that we could cite back and forth. The only thing I'd like to say to that is firstly about this argument about whether the fetus can inherit. I, think, I don't think laws like this turn upon really attenuated subtleties like that. Secondly, I think the reason we quote the extreme cases when we talk about the problem is that in the obvious case where the mother's life is threatened, she's dying, no one questions, I think, that abortion is okay. It's uh, in the extreme cases when we threatened. want to draw a line. It's in those really difficult cases that the problem arises. And then Father Drian's solution comes in and he says the law should withdraw. But you, I believe, are supporting the kind of, uh, are you supporting the model penal institute code? to I'm be enacted a, in New York? I'm supporting a variation on the model penal code. That is really code. different in a sense than Father Drenan suggesting that the law withdraw from the area, is it not? Well, it's only different in the sense that Father Drenan hasn't come before the state legislature to tell the legislators who are opposing any change to the law that that's what they ought to do. Would you support, well then, one would final question, I, would you I, rather support just, his, his uh, suggestion than yours? Just one second. Father Drenan would like to... I have a uh, question for Mr. Blumenthal that, as I understood, uh, <laughs> minutes, as I understood his presentation, he uh, is suggesting that we certainly should have the uh, same right to take prenatal life as we do to take uh, life after birth. And then he quotes the example of the escaping felon who, uh, in his uh, review of New York law, may be shot. And he quotes, the farmer can kill the person who is about to burn his barn. Well, the same American Law Institute model penal code that Mr. Blumenthal cites with uh, such esteem says that the escaping felon should not be killed, and that's one of the rules that they they bear down on, and they say that's Father, an error, and Father, that's one of the things I supported as a member of the ALI. Father, you're misquoting, first of well, all. You're, first of all, you are misquoting me. I did not say that either under the old or New York or new law that somebody ought to have the right to shoot the escaping felon. What well, I did say... Can, can, can shoot what the assailant. I, what I did say is that the use of deadly force can be met with it, but even under our revised law by the model penal code, one of the exceptions maintained is that destruction of property by arson is an excuse, is a justifiable reason for killing. Well, that's wrong. It's basically wrong. Well, it's and, and you can't take something that's wrong there and, and use it as an argument for your case. Are no, you just, just, one, just one of the absurdities in law that we seem to justify nobody pays too much attention to but when women talk about defending themselves or men for that matter under other circumstances then all of a sudden this distinction given about the vast importance to prenatal life and so little honor given to postnatal life this is the reason why I, I, I make these analogies not because they're all point four examples obviously they're not and obviously it's not because I support some of the stupidities in the New York revised penal law but I'm just amazed at, at at the things which bring up the debate. My name is Neil Jokelson. I'm a third year student. Father Drynan, uh, it seems to me that everybody on the panel agrees that the, the abortion laws in the United States are flagrantly violated. Yet it also seems to me that the abortion laws do have some deterrent effect, whatever they may be. If if, for example, there are one million abortions, perhaps two million are contemplated and only one million have gone through. Now, if that is the case, and if you believe that a fetus is as much a human being as any other human being, say, sitting in this room, then what you are saying is that the law which is capable of stopping murder should be thrown away and that murder should be optional with the mother. And it does not seem to me to be a wise solution taking the premises I understand you believe it to be. All right, fine. Well, if you say, if this is a deterrent effect, and we have a monumental ignorance about that, and I was going to say that I would stick with your proposition uh, until we have more information. After all, we have enough problems. We have Vietnam, and we have poverty, and now we have General, you know who I mean, Hershey. And uh, I would say that, that you are right, except there's a big if. Is there any real information that in this area, two million abortions would occur absent a law where only one million? It's like, as I mentioned, prostitution and gambling. We presume, but do we really know? Well, all right, I'm not it, advocating the change, sir, and you, you state my position well. It doesn't I, seem to me that if you throw the law away, there will be less abortions. That, that just logically doesn't follow. 
And then we're talking about, well, does the law prevent any abortion? And it seems to me it has to, whether it be one or a million or whatever the number may be. All right, sir, but nonetheless, there's this agonizing problem of these women who are in this situation, let's say a half million each year, who want an abortion and uh, are desperate for it. What is the solution to that social problem? Now, I'm not saying that the repeal of the law is going to automatically solve that social problem, but would it aggravate it? It might. Well, it seems to me that the interests of the one million women who want the abortion, if you believe that the fetus has a soul, is less than the interest that the fetus may have. And then what you're saying to one group, one group of people is, well, although your interest is less than life, you can take the life of somebody else to further your particular interest. All right, but there's a lot of implica which, implications in the withdrawal of criminal sanctions. You recall that I said that this is the certain way by which we can get this into medical channels. And doctors are not going to do abortions on a widespread scale for social reasons. And if the law then breaks down and can't enforce this thing... Well, excuse me. Yes. You don't know that. You don't, you don't know what doctors would do. You don't know if there are doctors who would be willing to abort at will, if the fee was right or if they felt a moral obligation, as doc, Dr. Guttmacher does. You don't know. All right. Well, I, I, we're saying the same thing. I don't think so. Well, yes, we are. <laughs> we're saying the same thing that I don't know, and I have said that, that's all. All I say is that the third option gives much more potential hope for solving the social problem than the model penal code, which I think is an abomination, which won't solve any of the problems. Well, at least the model penal code will go to deter those majority of women who would prefer not to have a child with no life it, or health. It, thing it will it. deter them. It will lead to the de facto authorization of abortion because people will say it's the mental health or girls will say it's statutory rape. Well, query. Well, all right. Well, it's a, it's a big conundrum. Perhaps this is, will be the last question. My name is... <laughs> the second one. My name is Jill Halpern. I'm a third year student at Harvard Law. My question is addressed to Father Drynan. Uh, I think the panelists generally agree that right now, the way the abortion laws stand in the books, it results in practice and in discrimination between the rich and the poor, or rather the middle class and the poor. Now, my question is, if uh, all abortion laws were eliminated, I think that there would still be that same discrimination between rich and poor, because the poor are known to take a far lesser advantage of medical facilities than the middle class. Would you oppose, if the abortion laws were eliminated, would you oppose government programs attempting to narrow the attitudinal gap between rich and poor by supplying information to the, middle, to the poor about the availability of abortion? All right, let me, let me say first that the model penal code would certainly uh, intensify the disparity between those who can get them and those who can't, because the wealthy woman of the upper middle class can always get good doctors and she can get an abortion. So that would certainly discriminate against the poor. Now, I mentioned that I have a greatest fear that this would become, abortion would become the birth control of the poor, and that uh, people, poor people, poorly educated, who uh, don't, are unwilling or unable to use family planning information and techniques, uh, that they would uh, become pregnant the fifth or sixth or seventh time. Should society have a quasi-coercion suggesting that abortion is the indicated remedy? It seems to me that if there's one freedom, it's the freedom to have children even if we say that this is irresponsible. And I'm very afraid that abortion will become the birth control of the poor. And under the social clause in the uh, English law that was just passed, I think that's clearly predictable that it was intended for that and it will become that. Well, I think that uh, I don't see it as coercing as changing the freedom of the poor to have children, but as changing the freedom of the poor to continue to be poor, which I don't think is a very valuable freedom. But uh, I think that, the that you're misusing the word coercion when you say... I said quasi-coercion. Quasi-coercion. Uh, I'm proposing that if the facts were made available to the middle class and the poor on an equal basis, uh, they would be enabled to make their own decisions in a way they can't really make now because they don't have the same available information on birth control or on abortion. Yeah, except the paradox there is that who are the people now getting illegal abortions. 
it's not the poor who don't have contraceptives available to them. It's the middle class and the upper class who can buy contraceptives and all types of things who, like, just forget. And so, uh, you know, the availability doesn't mean the, uh, that people are going to be wise and use these things. That's true, but we've never made the information available sufficiently well, to the poor to I, see All right, I, I advocated here that, that we all would say that public information, family counseling, all this type of thing should be available, tax support. You, you would not that. feel that, that there was any duty on Catholics to oppose that? Oh, no, we, we crossed that bridge years ago, please, get with it. That's <laughs> uh, <laughs> the last question now. Well, wait, wait a second. Uh, Mr. Blumenthal would like to comment also. There's just one thing that Father Drynan said which bothers me, and that is that, number one, in England, in England, with the National Medical Health Program, I hardly believe that, that, that abortion is for the poor. In America, in New York, I've been accused of sponsoring aborticade as in addition to Medicaid. Again, I, I, I must believe the physicians who have told me that it is not the poor who would suffer if, particularly in light of Medicaid services available in New York City hospitals, it would be those above the poor in terms of economic levels who don't quite make it to the upper middle class. I think, Father Drynan, you do an injustice when you, when you talk about those who get pregnant by mistake. I don't think that's the people we're talking about all the time. I think the woman who wanted to have a baby and got German measles didn't get pregnant by mistake. She wanted to be pregnant. She maybe got sick by mistake, but I don't think we punish sick people. Frank Kramer, first year law student. It seems to me that uh, part of Mr. Blumenthal's uh, espousal of roughly the model penal code's uh, provisions is because uh, while he feels that maybe the law should entirely withdraw from this uh, field, uh, the most he can do at this time is get across something of the nature of uh, the bill he sponsored and that this uh, type of bill will have an educational value and perhaps allow for uh, the law later entirely withdrawing uh, from the field. Now my question is to Father Drynan, uh, don't you think that uh, this educational value and this possibility of some revamping the law should be allowed as opposed to uh, what seems to me you're posing an impossible alternative, either keeping the present laws or going entirely all the way at once and withdrawing from, from the field. I don't think that it's educational except that it educates in the uh, wrong motives for things. It educates that uh, a woman for strictly selfish reasons really can uh, say that I, I don't want this child. And it also states that we don't want uh, undesirable children who uh, may not be bright and beautiful. So it seems to me it's not educational. It's educational in all the wrong values, values to which I am uh, very, very opposed. And I would much prefer the withdrawal. And I don't care about the political feasibility. That's somebody else's problem. And that I say that I, I, I you know, speak about moral issues and that if we're going to be honest about this whole thing and if we really want to help these individuals and if we say that the law can't control and can't impede and can't, uh, then, then let's, let's say that, all right, if it's not politically feasible, I'll oppose the model penal code, particularly the eugenic features, and I'll speak against it. And I will say that's a very disastrous thing of a utilitarian and pragmatic nature to allow into the law and that I'm not going to have the parade of the horribles and say that this is, uh, can lead to all types of things. But I think that the moment that you say that a class of people, because they are defective or infirm, can be wiped out, that th that is a very basic compromise with everything that we believe in. If I can just restate your position and get out of here, I guess. Uh, no, what I you're saying is that hmm. um, even though uh, without um, this sort of just making the public uh, tolerant, uh, aware, and allowing abortion gener uh, somewhat, if we uh, can't get to the withdrawal without this step, uh, then we shouldn't have this middle step at all. Isn't that right? Well, I spoke very, I, I don't care about rape or incest, and uh, uh, well, Mr. Blumenthal said there's less than 100 cases a year, and that's out of the hat, too. I doubt if there's 10 or 20 cases in the whole state of New York each year of rape. Pass that. Pass incest. I, I have no problem. No, no, with that. the point is that you can't but why do we have to couple these three things? Do, do they want three things or nothing? I'm willing to concede the second. I said that publicly. I've written that thing. Why do they must? Why they must they couple these three things? I fought that in the Model Penal Code and the American Lancet. Why must these three things? They're all unrelated. Totally unrelated. 
there. But if you can't get to the withdrawal, well, get, get, I don't care what that's not your get, problem. Then you're in a suspicious position because you, the if you can't go all the way, you've got to go part of the way. Uh, listen, I'm, I'm, it's not my problem in the New York legislature. I say these three things are totally unrelated to each other and totally different and proceed from different, totally different premises. So let them argue each one and let them fight each one, but don't package and say take this whole thing or nothing. I refuse to do that. Gentlemen, uh, on that on that note of refusal, uh, I think we should end the forum for tonight. Thank you.